you, you, can't, you can't keep calling before every show. I'm going to have to turn my phone off. Donna, I know, you've been fired from CNN, but did you watch the last show? David Lawson did spectacularly, and he didn't have, he didn't have the questions ahead of time. I mean, you might want to give me the questions ahead of time, but that's a whole other, all right, I got to go. I, I got a show to do. Bye. Hi, welcome to Progressive Soup. Again, not David Stevenson, Mark Morash filling in from the co-host chair to the host chair. We're going to be talking again with another David, David Lawson, running for state senate in the 30th district here in Connecticut. We're going to talk about education. If you watched yesterday's show, you'll see that he kept referring to the fact that everything begins with having an education system that really gets people started in life. And so we're going to talk a bit, maybe not so much about the campaign, but we're going to talk about his views on education. And I think you'll find as you listen and as you hear him talk that you'll realize that it's those traits of how he views education that makes him a great candidate for the open seat in the 30th district in state senate. So David, welcome back. Thanks well, for Well, thank being you here. very much for having me. I really like being in the studio here with you. Excellent. So, education, we were talking about it being the foundation of everything. Well, certainly, yes. Yes. In a nutshell, yeah, education is something that, you know, this country's always valued it. And we have from our independence days to right up until now. However, how we viewed it is different. Uh, we've come a long way. We have uh, women go to school, uh, uh, college now and universities. It's not, a, it's not an oddity anymore, pursuing advanced degrees. So we've come a long way, but now the question is, where, does it, where is that taking us? And, uh, and it all starts in elementary school. And that's where the foundation, as you mentioned, is for education. I think one of the important things about education is you can use it for a variety of things, virtually any profession, or you don't have to at all. But with education, it's, it's something that you will have for life, regardless. Regardless of circumstance, you will have it for life. And, uh, and I think that's something that we need to uh, uh, make accessible to those that would like to pursue a career. And, and I think that's another, th another thing that separates me from uh, my opponents. I'm not talking about jobs. I'm talking about careers, meaningful employment. I mean, we've all had jobs that we just loathe. Now, that doesn't make for a very productive worker. And that's what we need to do. Uh, and making it accessible is what we need to so, pursue. education, we start pre-K, but let's say public school starting in kindergarten. Yeah. When I was in kindergarten, there was a very large play aspect to it. I don't recall really sitting around yeah. a lot. Right. Um, you know, lots of wooden kitchen, lots of blocks. Yeah. I have a number of photos of in first grade of myself and friends building giant block structures up to the day. And that was how we spent our time, was that sort of interaction. Now, things have changed a little bit in mm -hmm. education where you kind of get to kindergarten and already you're sitting there and you're sort of, you're not desk bound, but you're in a much more rigid environment already. Well, the answer is yes and no. There's, rather than quote, free play, we now have structured play. So when you were building that tower, we're gonna throw in a very simple physics lesson. What happens if we move this one out? What happens if we put this one up? So we're still playing, but now it's structured and we're developing that creativity. We're developing those cognitive skills. Now granted, at that level, you, you still have a ways to go, but this is what, this is the, uh, an alternative way of playing, but now you're learning as well. Okay, so you were a big proponent of all-day kindergarten. <coughs> you got that happening in New Milford. How has that changed things from kindergarten on up? Well, we're still in the process. They're in fourth grade, I believe, now is our first Excellent. where okay. it is. So, we, you know, we're still measuring that and watching that closely. Um, I know one of the predictions was that uh, the kids would fall asleep in all-day kindergarten, which turned out to be 
almost true, but it was the teachers that needed the naps. Mm. Do they still get nap time in kindergarten no, now? No, 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 no. These kids, come on, you've got a five-year-old, you know. I, I, they go, go, go. I mean, we had nap time in kindergarten. You unfold the blue mat, yeah, I'm taking you down no. memory lane here, and you, you lay down, the lights go down, and you're back up, and you're refreshed, and no more nap time. No, they, 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 they go, they, I'm sorry, it, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a change, but yeah. hey, they, the kids are always in, active and involved. So education, let's turn it around. Mm -hmm. We've talked kindergarten quickly, and we'll come back to that. Let's flip it around where education has been a big issue in, let's say, the national campaign. You're talking about being able to freeze tuition so that school becomes more accessible. Ideas of free tuition in, wow. do you uh. see it as something that on the campaign trail was an impossibility? Do you see it as a potential down the line? What is your take on something that was a very well, hot button topic with the national Well, campaigns? I think what we found is very similar to uh, the health care uh, industry is these prices have ballooned in, in both higher education as well as in health care. And it's two things. Uh, you really have to set your priorities. Uh, and by doing so, yeah, we have to look at the costs of tuition. I mean, because that just cuts off accessibility uh, for those that are able and want to go. And that's something that we, we really shouldn't have. And of course, even if you can get the loans to be able to go, you wind up paying them off over Ooh. such a long Ooh. period of time that you wind up paying. It's like pay, buying a house. You pay X amount and you wind up paying 2X by the right. time you're done. Right. And, and again, the loans, student loans, federally subsidized loans are running between around 8%, which is 5, 4, all right, I'll be conservative, 4% above a bank rate. So we have that disconnect. Uh, which doesn't make much sense to me as, as either. Uh, so we really need to take a really hard look at this. I mean, at the very minimum, for those that are out of university now, they should be able to refinance their loans as we do with our mortgages. Mm. Many people refinance their mortgages at a much lower percentage rate. Uh, those that have graduated should be afforded that same opportunity because if that's that's way too much. So the tuition itself is way too much. So how do we start lopping zeros off of the end of things? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not running for president, Mark. Okay, I'm, I'm not running for president. Well, I'm prepping you yeah. for down. Okay, the line. I, I'm not. I'm not. Not quite at that level. Uh, I wish I knew all the answers. Yeah because we have so many other budgetary items that need attention. I alluded to health care. That's another one. If you don't, if we have a healthy Connecticut and if we have an educated Connecticut, those are two things that really will move the uh, economy, quite frankly. In your, in your platform, some of the bullet points that come up um, on your website, you talk about providing tax relief to the middle class. And so this is what comes up in every small town, every time the budget comes around. Why do taxes have to go up? Does the mill rate go up? And of course, the bulk of that tax goes to funding education. Now, you've been on the Board of Education for a long time, and you've gone through, I'm sure, many of these budget battles, some of which are nice and many of which are not. So if if the tax, if you're not going to be bringing taxes up, if you're going to find ways of relieving the tax on the middle class, you have schools that want to modernize with all of the new technology. What, where's the trade-off? What is the what is the ability to have modernized education while not taking taxes more and more and more and more? Right. Uh, again, this is more of a, a longer term, we need a short term solution to that as well as a long term. Long term we need to get away from the property tax idea for funding, period. Now that's going to be a tremendous undertaking and we can start with the property tax on vehicles for example and, and work on it that way and continue to do so. That's in the long term. Uh, as far as uh, 
taxes themselves. We need people in working. Yeah. And that's what's going to level off your taxes. And we're right around, you know, too many people are underemployed or unemployed. And that's a big burden right there. For folks who aren't a part of the 30th district who are watching the show, in terms of jobs, careers in your district that you're running for, what is the primary, what is the job base up there? Well, we have a variety. Um, the, 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 the 30th district uh, includes Brookfield, yeah. Torrington, Litchfield, Sharon, North Canaan, and everybody in between. So we have a, a very diverse district. We have some light industries in Torrington, for example. Mm -hmm. We have uh, a lot of agribusiness, and I think that's one thing that we overlook is the agribusiness in Litchfield County is doing very well, but I believe can do better. I believe we can do better with that. Uh, we have tremendous amounts of produce. We can see that with the numerous farmers markets. I mean, you see them right down here. Well, let's capitalize on that. Let's expand that. And when you're talking about expanding that, you're also talking about needing workers for that. We spoke on the show yesterday Excellent. about vocational education and how that has become uh, less and less in the state. I mean, I remember when I grew up, I grew up in Stanford and there was Wright Tech. Mm -hmm. And I know in this day and age, you know, enrollment in those are down, support for those are down, budget is down. Talk about vocational education and how important it is. Well, for the agribusiness, it's not important, it's necessary, period. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't mean to be cliche, but no farms, no food. It, it's true. Yeah. And we have a tremendous opportunities there. We have wineries over the last several years that have developed. So we have all that. But as far as the technical and vocational schools, let's not limit ourselves to, uh, we need to look at uh, high-tech uh, vocational schools, which we should have. Are we, there any in the state? I'm not familiar with a dedicated one. Okay. I'm not familiar with a dedicated one. Tell me what that would look like. What would it look like? Yeah, I'm curious. Um, a high-tech one would have your core subjects, so to speak, but see, and then I would also include in that your art and your music programs, not emphasized, but there is electives and this, that, and the other. But for high-tech, it, it's no longer just keyboarding, and it's no longer cut and paste, but uh, coding. Mm -hmm. We need to look at things. I mean, think of that. 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Hi, right, Dad, I want to be a webmaster. Wouldn't have meant a thing. Exactly. Hi, I want to work in cybersecurity. And this is what I was alluding to yesterday on the show by saying that education is something that you always have. We need to have the workforce to plug into those jobs that I don't even know what they are yet. Yeah, I don't even know what those careers are, yeah. but they will be there. You look at every generation, 1900, next thing you knew, we had auto engineers. Where did that come from? Then Boeing, one of our largest industries in the United States. Sikorsky started with his helicopters. Yeah. All of these, okay, were jobs you never would have thought. No, it's a great way of putting it, is, is preparing for the jobs we don't even know exist yet. I mean, in some way, you think about a high-tech high school, and you could almost say we're behind the times in that already. I would argue we are already. By yes. not having yes. something like yes. that. I can remember being in kindergarten, and on an Apple II, there was Logo with the turtle, and it was basic programming. It didn't do much other than draw a picture on the screen, but after that, it never happened anywhere. Computers essentially became games, uh, uh, a reward for finishing your work on time. I see, yes. You know, we had right. reading and math computers, just terminal screens. But other than that, there was, there was no access, there was no encouragement to it, unless you had something at home, mm -hmm. maybe. So in that regard, a high-tech school would be teaching coding, would be teaching kids to 
think in a technological manner in a, in a way that you don't get, it, it's not your home ec kind of, of lesson, mm -hmm. but it's your how to create that theory. And that theory that, it's why arts are involved. The Danbury Library exactly. has, instead of a STEM fair every few months, they have a STEAM fair. Right. Science, technology, engineering, arts. math. They put that. the arts Absolutely. in there. Yes. And, and, they, and they realize the connection. We always hear about all these famous scientists who invent something spectacular and they're a virtuoso piano player. Right. It's not a mistake. It's no, not an accident it that it works that way. No, and uh, I think that's the other thing we need to be cognizant of when I've been speaking about education is the arts uh, for a variety of reasons, but I'll, I'll, I'll start with the most obvious, and that is the professions. And particularly where we're located, uh, close to New York City, it, it's just a, amazing opportunities that we have with the arts. We have you know the music, the artists, the artisans, uh, all need our part, this is all part of our of our character, all part of our character, and these are things we we can encourage as well. I think what I'm hearing, you know, you're running for a district that is it the largest in Connecticut? It is the largest geographic district, and yes, I have that distinction yeah. of running for that one. Yes, the 14 towns cover well the northwest corner, so it's challenging. Yes. And it's challenging, but what's amazing about that is it sounds like you have a breadth of both knowledge and also vision of how to be able to incorporate all of these different places because you don't see them all as one entity. You realize the individuality of the towns, the differences of the towns, yet you still have to work for all of them together. Right, as I stated yesterday, they all have so many things in common, yet they're so different. And, and that's the way Hartford's been treating us is one size fits all. Well, it worked over here, and it worked there, so it's working for you guys. Do, no, 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 no. Do you feel like, and do the, do the constituents in the Northwest Corner feel like Hartford can't see clearly what they need given that it's a more rural area? See, that's, that's, that's the diversity. We're rural, but we're not. And, and that's, that's the trick, that's it. And that's why we need strong advocacy in, in Hartford, because of those diverse needs and, and desires. So coming back to education oh, for a moment, just because that's where yeah, we yeah, started, yeah, we, we built did. it up, and coming back around, we're talking about the idea of colleges being affordable, mm -hmm. tuition being frozen, way up the line. But going from elementary school into middle school into high school, one of the things you've advocated for are more counselors, guidance counselors. Yeah. Talk about what you've seen over your years of teaching and how things have evolved and how you both as a teacher as well as being on the board of ed education have had to evolve and adjust and assist as, as the students have changed, because I think all, what I hear from you and the compassion that I hear from you toward your students in education, those are the traits that are gonna bring folks who are undecided at this point in the election, they're gonna make them want to vote for you. So talk, talk to them about that. Well, um, it's not my observations. We've known that the tween years are critical. Uh, so many different things are happening in your lives. Uh, your parents are no longer your source of uh, support. This, that, well, they're there, but from the, the child's point of view, you're moving on to your friends. Those are the ones you now admire. We don't call it the wonder years for nothing because so many different things are going on. And in, at that age and in high school, and I know in New Milford we have tried very hard, and I would say done extremely well, providing extracurricular activities. Now, I'm not just speaking about sports, which we have a wide variety of sports, but inclusive activities that virtually every student, regardless, regardless, can pick one or two activities. Because we need that mentorship. It's no longer mom and dad, it's the coach. It's the advisor, 
okay, it's something like that. And that's what we, we know all this. We've always known this. Yeah. And, but to do that takes an investment. And speaking of, you were the proponent of getting pay for play removed from the sporting program. Yeah, I, I, that was a principle that I, I never really understood. Um, pay to play is to me uh, an economic discrimination, uh, like it or not, but that's how I, I, I had always viewed that and I am very happy to see that go. Again, accessibility, it's one of the themes for all that education and environment and health and economy are your points, it all comes back to accessibility exactly. for you and giving folks the opportunity and the means and the door being open so that folks don't have to put a foot in as it's closing and push it back open. Right, it, it, again, uh, back to the one size does not fit all. It, it truly doesn't, but the challenge is, all right, so let's make it work. Let's make it work, and that, that's the challenge. And it means a lot of hard work. It does. It means a lot of folks working Dedication, together. Dedication, but it also means a, a long-term plan. And you also have to realize that if it's not working, stop. Take another look and see if there's something you can do to make it work better. Well, there's something that comes back to education, the ability, the comfort to be able to raise your hand and answer something, potentially answer it incorrectly, and still feel comfortable about that learning process of right. getting something wrong. And that's, you know, we're in such a, a world of move quickly, get everything right. We always hear how many great discoveries came because something else went wrong. Right. And the yeah. accidental discovery. Sure, sure. And that's certainly a mindset that... Well, I, I, yeah, that's something the... the Critical skills, I, I will say in the last 10 years in Connecticut, and I can speak for New York State too, has been emphasized. But again, these are not things you're going to see overnight. You're just not. I'm, uh, I'm, <laughs> there are those yeah. that would say that modern education hasn't caught up or has decided that critical thinking skills aren't the goal of school because goals have become a lot of standardized testing. Right. What is the way that we do, we but get no, to critical thinking with modern kids? Well, actually, that's one thing that Common Core does address in giving schools and states latitude on the content to reach those goals. For example, if we wanted a uh, curriculum on citizenship, okay, we'll choose uh, Walcott nice Connecticut patriot, and we're gonna use that. Whereas in Texas that we talked about before, they may choose Sam Houston, as long as the standard is met. The content itself should be, and is, up to states, and then filtering it down even further into the local level. For example, we all teach the story of Sarah Noble in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. in Connecticut, in New Milford, whereas Danbury, maybe not so, okay? And that's okay, because we're fulfilling that standard. The testing, like I alluded to yesterday, now that's a whole different issue. I mean, you know, it's eight hours, six hours, two days of testing and pounding away. Uh, I'm not sure how accurate they would be anyway after that. I know how I would feel. If anybody's ever done shift work before, <laughs> you know what it's like. You're really good at the beginning, and at that end, we're watching the clock quite a bit and just getting it done. So I think we, and so a lot of these things we already know, but we need to put them into practice. And things that we probably have had in practice before, and like anything over time, if we're not reevaluating, right, that's a you critical slowly part. drift away from what works to maybe what becomes easy, what becomes simple, and what becomes the status quo. You got it. And here <laughs> we are with you stepping in to an election for a seat that is open going from Board of Education to saying, you know what, we need some new folks in these state seats, not someone who's mm -hmm. running, who has been there for a long, long time and has achieved 
a status quo. There's experience and there is success and they don't always go hand in hand. Well, experience, I've been teaching for 33 years and I say this to all the new teachers because they're always in awe and uh, say I've been teaching for 33 years. You know what that means? No, it means I've been teaching for 33 years. That's all it means. That, that's all it means. It doesn't mean I'm great. It just means I'm there for 33 years. You've been doing it. <laughs> and, and I think that's something that we need to understand too when, when we talk about experience. And uh, one of the other things you just said is when you hit that status quo level, so to speak, that's when you start becoming inefficient. And, and I think that that's one of the things, you know, I haven't really talked budget too much, but one of the quick f things we can do with the budget is look at those inefficiencies that we have, that we have not evaluated for years, and say, wow, that's really not working. It's, it hasn't caught up to the digital age, for example. Very much so. And, and these are the things that I think our means and a way to make all of this happen. So, David Lawson running for state senate in the 30th district, Lawson, L-A-W-S-O-N for senate.com. Check out his website, more about him, more about his issues. He also has a Facebook page you can link to off of there. He's given you both an overview of his issues and also sort of how he goes about things, how he's been a teacher for 30 years, been on the Board of Education. And I think and I hope what you've heard is someone who has both a realistic way of looking at the world, but even more importantly, a compassionate take on the world. So good luck to you on November 8th, just under a week from now, and uh, look forward to possibly having you back after the election and we can uh, talk again and see how things are going. Well, absolutely, the soup's great. Excellent, <laughs> glad you enjoyed. We'll try a different variety next time. This is Progressive Soup.